Oh my gosh, it's Christmas! Wait, why is it Christmas? And I don't mean like, why is the date very close to Christmas time? I mean, I know what time of year it is, but why is this locomotive? Besides the number, which 1225 in date writing shorthand is indeed Christmas day in American, because we put the month first, because we're right and the rest of the world is wrong. Well, her history doesn't have much to do with Christmas, but due to a variety of factors involving her preservation, you're looking at the spirit of Christmas in terms of locomotives anyway. Number 1225 is an N1 284 steam locomotive. She's a Berkshire that was constructed in October of 1941 by Lima Locomotive Works at a cost of $200,000. She was built for the Père Marquette Railway and they had actually ordered Berkshires in three different locomotive classes, the Class N, the N1, and the N2s. And they were extremely powerful locomotives. Berkshires were incredible pieces of work. A maximum speed of 70 miles per hour, a tractive effort of 69,350 pounds of force. They served faithfully even until Père Marquette's merger into the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway in 1947. And part of the merger agreement actually stipulated that the locomotives that were acquired and fully paid for by Père Marquette would remain painted for Père Marquette after the merger. This is relevant because technically speaking, all the ends, whether they be regular ends, ones or twos, were actually renumbered by Chesapeake and Ohio, but only the standard ends were repainted and renumbered visually. They wouldn't last long under Chesapeake and Ohio, though, as given the time frame, you may recognize this is the point in American history when things started to dieselize, and indeed, the vast majority of all the ends were scrapped between 1954 and 1957, but two N1s, 1225 herself, as well as her sister, 1223, wound up being preserved. In 1955, Michigan State University trustee named Forrest Ackers, who was also the former vice president of Dodge Motors, was approached by the Chesapeake and Ohio chairman, Cyrus Eaton. Eaton was inquiring as to whether or not the university would be interested in having a steam locomotive for display. This was because Eaton actually didn't want, deep down, to scrap the steam locomotives. He didn't have much of a choice because business but he was trying to find homes for many of them, and that was kind of his issue. He struggled to find places willing to accept these steam locomotives, as that's one of the biggest issues when it comes to preservation, is finding the space. There's only so many places willing to take these things. There weren't nearly as many heritage railways or museums around, let alone ones large enough to accept a Berkshire. Eaton's point was that the engineering students of the university would have a piece of real equipment to study if they took the locomotive. Ackers felt the idea had merit, and he proposed it to the university president, John Hanna, who did indeed accept the locomotive, since, hey, it was for free. Although when he told the dean of the College of Engineering about it, he said that engineering wasn't interested in an obsolete locomotive. Whatever, man. Hanna then decided to call up Dr. Roland Baker, who was the director of the MSU Museum, and told him about the locomotive. Baker was a bit more receptive to the concept, since it was a piece of history. Chesapeake, Ohio then instructed the yardmaster at New Buffalo to send an engine to the Wyoming shops for a cosmetic restoration and repainting, with the name Chesapeake, Ohio on the side, in preparation for the donation. Lighted number boards were actually added, as was the standard 4 C and O, the Pierre Marquette never used those. And why did 1225 get saved? Well, it was the same way that 4449 got saved. Yep, she was the first one in the scrap line, and therefore, the easiest to move. So, Lucky Her was sent to the university, and Baker received her in June of 1957, when she was brought to campus. She then was placed on static display near Spartan Stadium on the Michigan State campus in East Lansing, Michigan. And sat there for over a decade. And while she was on display, that's where she started being associated with Christmas, but not by anyone notable, at least at that time. A child, who was named Chris Van Alsberg, used to stop by the locomotive on football weekends on his way to the game with his father. He would grow up and become an author, and he would write the popular children's book, Polar Express. 
He later stated that it was 1225 who inspired him to write the story. But as for she herself, well, while Ackers was alive till 1966, money was allocated to paint and display her, at least to make her look presentable, give her some level of upkeep. Since she was outside, she might as well have been a park engine, and sitting outside did expose her to the elements. But that money helped offset some of the degradation she would suffer as a result of that. In 1969, a group of university students would form the Michigan State University Railroad Club, which, as the name would imply, was a group of rail fans. They loved trains, loved locomotives, and loved talking about all things in between. Steve Reeves, who was a student and part-time employee at the museum, had the responsibility to display 1225 on football weekends, and he sent out a notice in the state news that the railroad club would be having meetings. These early meetings had nothing to do with restoring 1225 in any capacity. They mostly just showed off slideshows of engines that different members had seen on trips across the United States, most of which happened to be diesels in those days. In 1970, at the suggestion of Randy Paquette, the club decided to get a little more proactive in their rail fanning. They investigated the possibility of restoring 1225 to running condition, and decided to start on that goal in 1971 with Baker's permission. He would later state that he wasn't really sure if they could pull it off, but he thought having the students be occupied with restoring 1225 was far more in keeping with his idea of the image the university should be presenting rather than campus protests. <laughs> well, hey, whatever works, man. Dr. Breslin, however, who was the university vice president, was way more skeptical of this. After they started removing the sheet metal, and exposed a rusty boiler that 1225 possessed, Breslin sent Baker to the engine with two messages. The first was the instruction to paint the engine, because she had to stay looking good even when she was being worked on. And the second message was that the day the students stopped working on her is the day the torches come out. She was safe as long as the club kept working on 1225. And to further emphasize his point, he had the hopper car that was actually on display next to 1225 cut up the next week. Okay, Burger Meister Meister Burger, I guess someone doesn't have the Christmas spirit around here. But admittedly, it did certainly keep the club motivated. They worked hard on the project for several years and they managed to fire up her boiler in 1975 and blew 1225's whistle for the first time in two decades. In terms of finding replacement parts, well, at first, they actually looked to 1225's sister, 1223, who was at the state fairgrounds. But the Michigan Railroad Club, who were the custodians of that locomotive at the time, strongly objected, so they had to fabricate the parts instead. In 1977, a man by the name of Dr. Edgar Hardin became the university interim president. Jacques Julian, who was the president of the MSU Railroad Club, went to his reception and made an appointment to see him later. Julian asked the interim president about 1225's future, as they had managed to fire her, and she was nearing the point of being fully operational. Arden said that the university wasn't interested in running a locomotive, and even if it was, 1225 would have to be run by all university employees. He said that if the railroad club wanted to run the engine, they should form a 501c3 corporation. And if they did that, he would just straight up give them 1225. But there were other issues to work out. During that meeting, Hardin told Julian the university was actually closing the Shaw Lane power plant and planned to pull up the tracks that were laid down there. The railroad had informed the university that it didn't want to maintain a switch on a line not being used. Without a switch, there would be no need to keep the track. And that meant that the club wanted to get 1225 off the display track and onto the main line. They needed to move her very soon. But Dr. Hardin did give them permission to connect the display track to the siding and move 1225 over to a part of the track near the police station. With the provision that they provide a bond, remove the fence, stairs, and all of the belongings from the display site, and then be the ones to tear up the track they put down, along with the display track to get it out of the way. They also had to repair the sidewalk that it needed to go through after it was done and clean everything up. 
Colin Williams of Williams Brothers Asphalt Paving Company of Ionia, Michigan, wound up providing the club with a bond, as well as a dump truck, a front end loader, and a bulldozer, plus operators to run the equipment which was used to build the grade. They then tore up the track next to the engine and laid it down behind her. 1225 was then rolled backwards. Julian, Dave Jones, an equipment operator from Williams Brothers, Dick Greaves, and a group of among refugees who had just volunteered their time, actually, wound up spending the next three days restoring the site. That included casting a new sidewalk out of concrete, as well as loading debris into the dump truck and rails onto a flatbed and hauling it away. Dr. Harden would also go on to say that if the club could find another place for 1225 on campus that was suitable, they could move her there. He assigned Ted Simmons and the head of the Landscape Arts Department the task of working with Julian to find a location. They visited several sites, but Simmons wasn't willing to give up a siding at Power Plant 65 for 1225. If the club wanted one, they would have to build it on their own, and the club wouldn't be able to build a cheap structure there. It would need to be built by contractors after the university approved the design, making things a little... Little more difficult, aren't ya? Due to how annoying this was getting, the club members started looking for a new site entirely, and several were looked at. The Ann Arbor Railroad had gone bankrupt at that time, and the state of Michigan became the owner of its assets. Hank Lando went to speak with his state senator, and arranged for the new Michigan State Trust for Railway Preservation to lease the Owasso Engine Shop, which would be a perfect place for 1225. She and all of her equipment were then moved to that location, and the shop still contained a lot of equipment that could be used to finish the work they'd already done on 1225. In 1978, the club and supporters of what was known as Project 1225 had formed the Michigan State Trust for Railway Preservation. Chuck Julian would go on to be their first president, and soon after, they were given ownership of 1225 by the Michigan State University just as Dr. Hardin had promised. She would be officially moved to the shop in 1983. Two years after that, on November 30th, 1985, 1225's restoration work was finished. She moved again under her own power for the first time since her initial retirement back in 1951, over 30 years. And her first excursion trip happened in 1988, it was a 17-mile journey between Owasso and St. Charles, Michigan. In August of 1991, 1225, along with Nickel Plate 765, pulled a 31-car passenger train during the National Railway Historical Society's annual convention down in Huntington, West Virginia. The trust would eventually start using the name Steam Railroading Institute because they felt it better represented the goals of their organization. Though the official name on paper is still Michigan State Trust for Railway Preservation. Steam Railroading Institute, or SRI, is instead registered as a DBA, doing business as, with the state of Michigan. 1225 would carry on excursion duties. In 2009, 1225 would attend the Train Festival in Owasso, Michigan, from July 23rd to the 26th, as part of a fundraiser to raise money for her upcoming 2010 to 2013 FRA overhaul. The national event showcased hundreds of related items, all from around the country and other parts of the world as well. 1225 was not able to haul any excursions during that though, due to five of her flus deciding it was a really good time to fail. And she wound up sitting on display for people to visit her instead, as well as being able to talk with her crew, take photos, and explore her cab, so it was still a great time either way. On October 7th, 2008, it had actually been announced that 765 would once again join 1225 at the train festival, which had been their first meeting since 1991. Southern Pacific 4449 was also there, and 1225 and 765 would meet up twice more that same year with a photo freight in August, as well as an excursion in October. But the flu failing thing happened again, really inconveniently, on December 5th of that year. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. It's Christmas. You can't fail now. In January of 2010, she went down for her required 15-year inspection, and it was found that the firebox sheets had deteriorated to the point of needing a complete replacement. 
And that, that is expensive. They did wind up pulling it off, though, through a combination of small and large donations of funds and labor by the organization's supporters. In the end, they spent $900,000 accomplishing this goal. Have I not repeatedly explained to you people how expensive it is to maintain a steam locomotive in the modern day? It ain't cheap! Most of the infrastructure, the fabrication tools, all of it is gone. It is such a nightmare. On October 20th, 2013, she was fired up for a test run and moved again for the first time since 2009, and the next overhaul work isn't due until 2028. As of 2014, she still operates excursion trains over the Great Lakes Central Railroad, including operations that leave Owasso and going to locations like Alma, Clare, Mount Pleasant, and Cadillac, Michigan. Since 2004, She's hauled winter weekend excursions to Ashley, Michigan as well, between Thanksgiving and the middle of December. Not as the Polar Express due to copyright issues, but as just the North Pole Express. It is the Polar Express. She is the Polar Express. She was the locomotive in the story. Don't you lie to us. We know what you're about. Merry Christmas, everybody! In 2021, she had her leading wheel, trailing wheels, and tender trucks upgraded with roller bearings. And in 2022, she actually went under a significant overhaul to her wheels and running gear with some assistance from FMW Solutions. In late 2023, like right now, as we speak, she did go back into service, just in time for Merry Christmas, with a new dual beam headlight, a digital thermocouple, a second Nathan mechanical lubricator taken from Nickel Plate Road 757, along with a temperature sensor and alarm systems for the crew to monitor the brass and bearing boxes. All this makes her one of the safest steam locomotives operating in the modern day. And based on her track record, she's liable to continue operating for many, many years. In between overhauls, of course. And do you know why? Do you know why she's going to? Because this is Christmas, and you can't destroy the spirit of Christmas. The season is about giving and joy, and 1225's gonna bring it to you whether you like it or not. It Christmas! Merry Christmas! And with that, a special thank you because to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Benzer Kitson, 131-232, and Zach A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust the Third, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Lord Off444, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Tribal Typhoon, Royal Hudson 2860, Iser for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, Ennis Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Kayla Cross White, Ohio Trucker 1, Joshua Long, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Hayden DeGrow, Kayla Brain Waters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Arizona Hot Rail, Liam Wright, Mr. Sleepy, and Dr. Racer 78. Till next time, this is Darkness and a Bitwell of Fond. Merry Christmas, everybody!